Bonjour, madame et monsieur. Messieurs, oh, I'm supposed to be in English today. All right, I will switch. Je ne parle pas français, anyway. Which is very embarrassing because my family is from Alsace. But my father always thought of Alsace as being German, so ich spreche gut Deutsch. But yeah, je ne parle pas français. So here we are. I'll use English today. So what's happening on the internet? Well, let's find out. First of all, let's go back in time to 1969 when the ARPANET, which was the predecessor to the internet, was built. I was a student at UCLA and we were working on connecting a computer called a Sigma 7 to the ARPANET interface message processor, which we would call a packet switch today. Interestingly enough, the Sigma 7 is now in a museum somewhere and some people think I should be there along with it, but here I am. This was the first experiment in a relatively wide area for, uh, for packet switching in 1969. And this is what the packet switch looked like. It was the size of a refrigerator. One of them is at UCLA now, the one that was first installed in September of 1969. Three of us celebrated the 25th anniversary of the ARPANET. That's uh, me on the right, uh, Steve Crocker, who led the network working group that developed the first host-to-host -host protocols and some of the application layers above, and Jonathan Postel, who I'm sorry to say passed away in 1998, but for many, many years he was in charge of managing the domain name system uh, and all of the IP address space of uh, the internet and the predecessor ARPANET. We were experimenting with mobile radio in those days, in the early and mid-1970s. And at SRI International, we had this big packet radio van that drove up and down the San Francisco Bayshore Freeway uh, in the uh, San Francisco area. Uh, it had inside, uh, well, oh, outside, uh, we, were, we had the military involved. They were interested in doing packet radio for tactical operation, and so we had them uh, get into the van and drive up and down the Bayshore Freeway to see how we could communicate without wires uh, and reliably with these protocols. Inside, uh, we had these radios that were about a cubic foot in size. Those are the white things in the middle there. Uh, they cost about $50,000 each at the time. And of course, now you carry things on, in your pocket or in your purse that are much higher speed and much, much higher power computing and memory than these devices had, but this was in the 1970s. They used spread spectrum technology, which was quite advanced at the time, 1975 or so. We also experimented with packetized voice. So voice over IP uh, was being looked at as a possible application on the internet uh, in, in the mid-1970s. Of course, the quality of the voice was still pretty limited because the um, underlying bandwidth of the system ranged from 50 kilobits a second to perhaps, uh, in one case, 400 kilobits a second. You can't put very much 64 kilobit voice uh, into uh, you know, a, a 50 kilobit channel. So we used what is called linear predictive code with 10 parameters, LPC10, in order to uh, reduce the data rate for the voice from 64 kilobits a second to 1800 bits per second. So it was a much compressed uh, kind of sound. And of course you do lose a certain amount of quality when you compress the speech that much. Uh, in fact, uh, anyone who spoke through this system sounded like a drunken Norwegian. So the day came when I had to demonstrate this system to some generals at the US Pentagon and I remember thinking how am I going to do this and then I remembered that one of the early participants in the internet was from the Norwegian uh, research establishment uh, Ingvar Lund and uh, so we had Ingvar speak through the regular telephone system that the military used then we had him talk through our packetized voice system and it sounded exactly the same we didn't tell the generals that everyone would sound that way if they spoke through the system. So that was our early experience. We also were experimenting with packetized video in the late 1970s and early 1980s. So many of the things that we take for granted today are part of uh, this, uh, we're part of the experimental environment uh, as far back as 1975. 
1977, a very important test was done where three different uh, types of packet nets, a packet satellite network over the Atlantic, the packet radio network in the San Francisco Bay Area, and the ARPANET, uh, were all run together using the internet protocols of the time. It was an amusing uh, test because we had someone in the packet radio van driving up and down the Bayshore Freeway radiating packets. They went through a gateway into the ARPANET. They went all the way across the ARPANET through a satellite hub from to Norway and then down to University College London and then out through a packet satellite gateway over the packet satellite network, which is a different satellite, to the east coast of the United States, and then through another gateway into the ARPANET again, all the way across the ARPANET to uh, USC Information Sciences Institute in near Los Angeles. So although the packet radio van was 400 miles away from Los Angeles, the packets went about 100,000 miles because they went up and down on two satellite links and back and forth across the Atlantic Ocean. And it worked. And I remember we were jumping up and down saying, it works, it works, as if it couldn't possibly have worked. After all, it's software, and it's always a miracle when software works. So this was a very important milestone for the internet, because it demonstrated that we could get three different, very distinct kinds of packet networks interconnecting successfully uh, using uh, the TCP IP protocols. This is what the internet looked like in 1999, and I think it probably looks similar today. This was calculated by looking at the global routing tables of the internet. Each color is a different autonomous system. You could think of that as a different network. And so this, the interesting thing about this diagram is that it demonstrates what a giant collaboration the internet is, because it's hundreds of thousands of networks all independently operated uh, of each other, they work because of the standard protocols. But each one of these entities decides uh, which equipment it's going to use, it decides when it's going to upgrade equipment, it decides uh, essentially uh, with whom to interconnect. Uh, they, uh, people who are part of the system uh, negotiate interconnections uh, independently of, of any top level authority. So it is entirely distributed. All the decision making is distributed and it seems to work in spite of uh, all of that apparent, um, well, confusion if you like. So now what about statistics? Uh, these are now rather out of date, but the source of the statistics hasn't produced any updates and maybe they won't. It was from uh, an organization called Internet World Stats. At that time, a year ago, uh, there were slightly under a billion machines that were on the public internet that had uh, domain names and had fixed IP addresses. So typically these were servers. I would guess a year later that uh, we might have um, several billion, uh, maybe at least one or two billion machines that are online in that way. The number of users in the middle of last year, a year ago, was 2.4 billion. I think it's fair to estimate 3 billion people online today uh, all around the world. Well, one thing that has contributed to this increase in uh, access to the internet is mobile telephones. And I'm sure all of you appreciate that. Uh, in fact, some of the speeds that are available on mobile phones exceed what is available on uh, wireline services. Probably 25% of all of the phones, mobile phones in use are now smartphones, and that percentage will go up over time. But for many people, their first experience on the internet will be through a mobile phone, and later perhaps through a laptop or a pad or a desktop machine. Here's where the users were in the middle of last year. And I would guess that the Asian numbers have uh, grown substantially since then. At that time, of the one billion people in Asia that were online, a half a billion were in mainland China. That was a year ago. It would not surprise me to learn that a substantial increase, perhaps two or three hundred million more Chinese are online than there were a year ago. And that's still only a modest penetration, perhaps 30 to 35 percent penetrated in, in China. So you can imagine what these numbers will look like uh, as China reaches the same penetration as we have here in Europe or uh, in the United States. 
North America used to be the largest concentration of users in the internet, but this is no longer the case. Europe now has over half a billion users online, but I've given up making any projections about Europe because you keep adding countries, so the definition of Europe keeps changing. And so one can't really make guesses about the future. But you do represent a highly penetrated population of internet users, and that's why we expect to see an increasing number of applications arising out of the use uh, of the internet in Europe. The other uh, statistics are as you see them here. So there are some things that have happened to the internet in the recent past that are very important, and it underscores the fact that even though we are celebrating the 40th anniversary of the design of the internet this year, it has continued to evolve. Two year, uh, last year, actually, in uh, June, a year ago, we officially turned on IP version 6, which has 128 bits of address space. And uh, Bob Metcalf, who's here in the audience and from whom you will be hearing later, and I had over dinner last night, uh, recalled that both of us ended up with 32-bit address space uh, notions coming from different directions. He wanted to have many, many LANs, local, uh, local area networks, made out of Ethernet, his invention. And I just wanted to have enough networks so that there were uh, networks in every country in the world. But 32 bits turned out not to be enough. It was OK for an experiment. It would represent 4.3 billion terminations, which sounded like a lot in 1973 when that number was selected. But we ran out in 2011. And so now IP version 6 is running in parallel. It has 128 bits of address space, which is enough for 3.4 times 10 to the 38th addresses. This is a number only the parliament can appreciate. Uh, and now uh, we're hoping to see uh, further penetration of that alternative address space. The other thing which has happened recently is the introduction of non-Latin characters in the domain name system so that people whose languages are not expressible in Latin characters uh, can uh, use domain names as easily as others can. And ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, has opened up the top-level domain space uh, to allow for up to 2,000 submissions uh, or applications for new top-level domains, since that process is now underway. The domain name system itself is known to have security vulnerabilities, and so my colleague Steve Crocker, who is now the chairman of ICANN, uh, and his colleagues have been pushing very hard to introduce a domain name system security mechanism which digitally signs every entry in the domain name system space so that when you inquire what is the IP address associated with a domain name, you can ask for a, a digitally signed response, a verified response. So you have some confidence that the pair, domain name and IP address, are, belong together and, and have not been altered to move you to an illegal uh, target. Another thing which is not yet in operation but is being considered is to do a similar thing with the routing system because the routers listen to announcements coming from the autonomous system saying, hello, I'm autonomous system number 702 and I am uh, hosting the domain, I'm, I'm hosting addresses in this space. So if you see any packets that are in this block of addresses, please send them to me. That's an announcement. The problem is anyone could make such an announcement and in fact lie about having access to or responsibility for a particular address space. So the idea that the regional internet registries have, they're responsible for allocating IP addresses, is to digitally sign entries in a table so when an announcement is made, you can check to see whether or not the party making the announcement has the authority to do that. Now, the other things at the bottom of this slide uh, speak to other things that are becoming part of the internet environment. Sensor networks, a smart grid of devices that use electricity and, and are uh, programmable, and finally, mobiles, which we all know about, and I'll cover some of that momentarily. Oh, I, this is a little example of uh, Dr. Seuss, whom some of you may or may not know, who used to make children's books, also makes uh, sculptures, and I couldn't resist this one. Uh, 
because it looked like a very surprised animal saying, what do you mean you haven't implemented IPv6 yet? So those of you who have internet service here in France, please ask your ISPs what their IPv6 plan is so as to encourage them to get on with implementation. These are some statistics uh, from uh, a particular uh, website, Media Bistro, uh, that give you a sense for the scale of use of internet. Languages in use, English, Chinese, Spanish, Japanese, and Portuguese are all in the top uh, list. Some 38% of the media interactions are uh, using smartphones. There are 100, estimated to be 140,000 new websites every day, but it isn't clear from that statistic how many disappear. Uh, and I don't know that answer either. Uh, 144 billion emails a day, and some people think 70% of them are spam. Uh, and 100 hours per minute of video are uploaded into YouTube every day, and of course 133 million hours of video watched per day on YouTube, and that's just a recent statistic. There are estimated to be 540 billion photos uploaded every single day in the Internet. There's a company called Waze, which was recently acquired by, uh, by Google, it has 48 million users, and they share information about the current conditions of traffic so as to improve your ability to navigate. A billion miles have been driven uh, in the last year using that particular mechanism. I'm, I'm not going to read all of these. I just want you to get a sense for some of the activity which is uh, coloring the way in which the Internet is both used and it's evolving. Something about social media, just to say that this sounds like something new. And we hear about Facebook and Google Plus and so on, Twitter and LinkedIn. But I can tell you that when electronic mail was invented in 1971, within a couple of weeks of its uh, introduction on the ARPANET, this is before the internet, some distribution lists were created. And it was very clear that this electronic mail idea had a social component to it. Uh, the first distribution list using email was called sci-fi lovers, that is to say, people who read science fiction and enjoyed it. There should be no surprise there because the people who set those lists up were a bunch of engineering geeks and they all read science fiction. The next one that was set up was called Yum Yum, and it was a restaurant uh, assessment distribution list for restaurants in the Palo Alto, San Francisco Bay Area. Those two examples instantly showed how email could become part of a social environment. And so 40 years ago, it became obvious that many of this networking, uh, many of the networking applications would have these social components to them, and it simply emphasized more and more today. Many of you have heard the term Internet of Things, and I know I've been very surprised over the course of the last four decades at the kinds of things that have been put up on the network. Things like refrigerators and picture frames that download images from a website and cycle through them. Um, mobile phones, which we're all making use of today. I used to tell jokes about light bulbs. I said one day, Maybe 20 years ago, I said that someday every light bulb in the, in the world will have its own IP address, as if that were a funny thing to say. Well, it isn't funny anymore because someone just sent me an internet-enabled IPv6 LED light bulb. It costs about $20, and it probably lasts about 15 years. And so the cost of putting the radio in with the IPv6 uh, component is about 50 cents. And so in a $15 uh, light bulb or $20 light bulb, that's a very modest increase in cost. And then, of course, there's the fellow in the middle who has an internet-enabled surfboard. Uh, I don't know him. We've not met. But I imagine he's sitting on the water waiting for the next wave to come, thinking, if I had a laptop in my surfboard, I could be surfing the internet while I'm waiting for the next wave. So he puts a laptop in the surfboard, he puts a Wi-Fi service in the rescue shack, and now he sells this as a product. And finally, uh, Google Glass. In the lower right, you see Sergey Brin wearing uh, Google Glass, which is, for all practical purposes, a mobile that's more comfortable to uh, wear on your head. I mean, it, it's about the same functionality as strapping a mobile to your forehead, but it's a lot more comfortable. So those are just a few of the things that are happening. And here's another example. Um, sensor networks. In my house, I have an IPv6 uh, sensor network, which is self-organizing. 
Each of the sensors is detecting uh, the temperature, the humidity, and light levels in each room in the house every five minutes. And then the packets with that information are routed through the wireless network to a server down in the basement where that information is recorded. And at the end of a year, I have detailed engineering information about how well the heating, the ventilation, and air conditioning system have worked. You can imagine using this in an office building in addition to a residence. You can imagine extrapolating this to not only include environmental information, but also security and other things. This is going to be very common. What's important is that it's a self-organizing network. So the radio connectivity may be changing with time, but the system automatically compensates for that. It runs on two AA dry, uh, batteries and lasts for just about a year before you have to replace the batteries. Now, one room in the house is the wine cellar. And it's very important to me to keep it below 60 degrees Fahrenheit uh, and at least uh, 30 or 40 percent humidity so the corks don't dry out. So that room has been alarmed. And if the temperature goes above 60 degrees Fahrenheit, I get an SMS on my mobile. This has happened a couple of times. And one time it happened and no one was at home to reset the cooling system. So I was very worried about that. Every five minutes for the next three days, I kept getting a little SMS saying your wine is warming up. So I called the people that make this equipment. Uh, the company was called Artrock, and they were acquired by Cisco uh, a couple of years ago. And I asked them, do you make remote actuators? And they said yes. So that was a little weekend project to put in a remote actuator so I could remotely reset the cooling system. I also asked them if it had strong authentication because there's a 15-year-old next door and I didn't want him to mess around with my wine cellar. So uh, after we got all done, this was all set up, and I got to thinking, you know, I could probably tell if someone has gone into the wine cellar without, uh, when I'm away because I could tell if the light has been turned off and on, but I don't know what they did in there. So now my next project is to put RFID chips on each bottle. And then I can do an instantaneous inventory to see if any bottles have left the wine cellar without my permission. I was explaining this design to an engineering friend of mine, and he said, you have a bug in your design. I said, what do you mean I have a bug? He said, well, you could go into the wine cellar and drink the wine and leave the bottle. <laughs> so now we're going to have to put sensors in the cork. And as long as we do that, we may as well sample the esters to uh, see whether the wine is ready to drink. So before you open the bottle, you interrogate the cork. And if that's the bottle that got up to 75 or 80 degrees Fahrenheit, that's the bottle you give to Bob Metcalf because he won't know the difference. You're welcome, Bob. So this is an example of the sort of thing that is happening now. And I submit to you it will be very common to see these kinds of sensor nets as part of the internet environment. There. So here's another example of uh, really advanced work at Google. Uh, the self-driving cars began <clears throat> as a defense department initiative, just like the internet did, and the packet radio and packet satellite and ARPA nets. In this particular case, the idea was to build a vehicle that could drive 127 miles on its own. The first year that the contest was held, none of the cars made it more than seven miles before they ended up in the ditch. But uh, the second year, most of them made it all the way through, and the winner was Stanford University. The next year, the uh, cars were made to drive in a, an urban environment, and uh, that year, Carnegie Mellon won. So Google hired both teams from Carnegie Mellon and Stanford, and now our Google X department, where we do all the interesting new things like Google Glass, is where the self-driving cars are. Uh, eventually, these cars will be able to communicate with each other. They'll be able to coordinate and negotiate uh, changes in, in the flow of traffic or movement from one place to another, in addition to deciding what to do when you come up to a four-way intersection. So I'm, many of us believe that cars will be safer if humans don't drive them, because the cars are doing only one thing. They're driving. They, they don't get angry. Uh, they're not in a hurry. They just want to get you from the beginning to the end of the trip. And of course, they're looking 360 degrees all the time. 
unlike human beings who are only looking ahead at best and sometimes they're not even doing that. So this is a much safer environment if you can make it work. We have driven 500,000 miles in the city of San Francisco in these cars with no accidents. Uh, there are about a fleet of about 24 cars making up uh, all of that. So uh, we don't anticipate this will be a commercial product in the near term, <clears throat> but we think certainly in the, a decade or more ahead, uh, these could be reasonably expected to work. So I mentioned very briefly the smart grid, and I just want to emphasize that the idea of creating um, uh, appliances that are programmable and that will respond to advice is a very powerful step in the use of electricity. And we're going to hear from uh, Bob Metcalf uh, more about this whole notion of networking and uh, electrical power. In this particular case, the two things that are valuable are, first of all, the devices can tell us how much they were used and when they were used. So at the end of the month, instead of just getting a bill saying you used this many kilowatt hours, it tells you which devices you used and how much. This feedback might allow you to change your mind about choices in the use of electrical appliances, possibly to change the, when the air conditioning is running, when the water heater is running. The other thing, though, is that these devices could be told to listen to advice. For example, we are approaching a peak load in the power generation system. And if you don't need to run for the next 15 minutes, please shut yourself off. This way we can serve uh, the use of power. We don't have to build power generation plants that are only used one or two percent of the time at peak load. And so we, we suppress the, uh, the peak load uh, demand. This is called demand response, and it's something which is uh, very much underway in the US and in other parts of the world. I think it would be uh, appropriate to at least spend a moment or two on the kinds of policy challenges that face the internet today. And I'm sure there is much debate in Europe about the way in which the internet is used or abused and what to do about it. There is an internet governance forum which meets every year. It came out of the World Summit on the Information Society. It's not a decision-making body, but it's a place where multi -stake many stakeholders, the scientific community, the academic community, the private sector, civil society, and governments can meet and discuss what the issues are that are beginning to show up in the internet and to debate ways in which to deal with them. Uh, the idea there would be not to make decisions, but to identify problems and to uh, speculate about where those problems might be solved. So if it's an intellectual property issue, it might be dealt with in the World Intellectual Property Organization. If it's a business or a trade issue, the problem might be resolved in the World Trade Organization. Or perhaps there will be need for other uh, multi-stakeholder and international organizations to cope with some of the other problems. The International Telecommunications Union has in the recent past become increasingly interested in internet. Uh, it's not surprising because the basic um, uh, standards that the ITU has been responsible for on the radio side and on the uh, telecom side have drifted further and further into uh, internet. So voice is being run over IP. Uh, video, broadcasting, and, uh, and the like are all part of the IP environment now. So the ITU has uh, uh, found it uh, important to try to expand its uh, footprint to include internet-related activity. The problem, of course, is that it's running into pre-existing organizations like the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, or the Internet Engineering Task Force, or the Internet Society, which have also established uh, a long history of being involved in uh, internet uh, policy and technology. And so there is some collision going on uh, in that space. There are major issues associated with privacy and with safety and security on the internet. And they all, we see the headlines every day about uh, information that's been lost um, by uh, attacks against the internet or by mistakes that have been made that cause information to be released. I'd like to suggest uh, a point here that we introduce another word in our vocabulary. People speak of cybersecurity, and unfortunately, I think it drifts very quickly into national security. And I think for many of us, 
The real problem is not that there is a national security problem. It is that we have systems that are not easy to defend against attack. And I'd like to suggest a kind of metaphor. Imagine for a moment that you are in, uh, outside of your home and it's on fire. And you are standing there with a garden hose. Your first reaction may be, I need someone with a bigger hose and more water to put out the fire. You don't call the police department to deal with the fire. You call the fire department. The fire department's job is to put out the fire. After that's done, the fire department investigates to see how the fire started. And if it turns out it was started by a person, that's arson, and they would call the police department in order to figure out what to do. But it's only then that you conclude that you should go treat this as a criminal case. It's too easy to decide that every bad thing that happens on the net is a result of a criminal activity. And I'd like to suggest that it isn't. And in fact, there are a lot of things that happen by accident that can be mistaken for crimes, but are simply engineering mistakes. So it would be nice to have a cyber fire department to call, especially if you're a business maybe a small one that doesn't have a lot of engineering talent to manage internet problems. But if you're under attack or there is a problem, you want to call somebody to come and help, and that should be the fire department. There's a big debate over whether people should be allowed to be anonymous on the internet. Yeah, I believe that you should have the, the um, opportunity or the, the right to be anonymous on the net. But at the same time, I think we should have very strong authentication mechanisms when you need them. So, uh, for example, I can imagine Bob Metcalf and I pretending not to know each other for a moment, Bob, uh, might be exchanging email, and I know him as Bob Metcalf at some website, and he knows me as Vince Cerf, but we don't know who we are. We're just exchanging information. But one day, uh, I go to Bob and I say, Bob, I'd like to borrow 100,000 euros. And at this point, Bob says, well, I think I need to know a little more about you than your email address. And so he now expects me to provide a lot more detail. And of course, there's no reason for him to believe anything that I say. And so he now has to go to a third party who has to be trusted in order to validate what I tell him. I can easily imagine having very strong cryptographic methods for securing these exchanges and making sure that they have integrity, they haven't been modified. And so there is a case where both of us need to understand who the parties are in some detail. But not all transactions require that, and I think we should preserve this spectrum of anonymity and uh, strong authentication. There are other examples of policy issues. For example, what is a digital signature and what does it mean legally? So if we have a contract with each other which we digitally signed and someone breaks one of the terms of the contract, the question will be, where do we adjudicate the disagreement and how strong is the digital signature compared to a wet signature on a piece of paper, and we don't have case law yet which determines that, and so I think we are going to have to work through that. There are huge debates about intellectual property protection, copyright, patents, and the like, and here I think we have a collision because the ease of replication of digital content and the fact that the World Wide Web is basically a big copying engine uh, is colliding with the way in which we have treated intellectual property in the past. The reason I say the World Wide Web is a copying engine is that that's the way the browsers work. The browsers go to a website, copy a file, and then interpret it and present it to you. So uh, that's a form of copying, and I'm sure anyone who is trying to protect copies of things sees this as a, a very scary kind of development. There's one other point I'd like to make here, and that's that uh, as we generate more and more digital information, we are going to rely increasingly on software to interpret what those digital bits mean. Now, I think it's easy for us to keep copying bits from one medium to another. So we can go from five and a quarter inch floppies to three and a half inch floppies to CDs to DVDs to Blu-ray to something else. The bits can be preserved. But we may need to keep the software around that knows what the bits mean in order to make sense of them. But that's going to be a challenge because the software may run on a particular operating system on a particular machine. But what if you change operating systems? What if the operating system is upgraded? 
What if the company that made the software goes out of business? What if the next version of the software isn't compatible with the previous version and previous formats? What we need is a kind of digital vellum. You know, vellum is something which lasts for a very long time, a thousand years or more. And we can read it still, if we can read ancient Greek, for example. But what we need is the digital equivalent of this. So we want media that last a long time, or at least can be copied from one medium to another. And we need to preserve the software and the ability to execute it. It may be that um, the cloud systems may, may solve this problem in part, because you can imagine emulating an operating system on a piece of emulated hardware running a particular application so as to read the old bits in the old formats. So we need to work on that. Or, in the end, the people in the 22nd century will know nothing about what happened in the 21st century because all of the bits will be uninterpretable. So I'm going to skip this slide because I want to leave some time for, uh, for discussion. I would like to give you a quick update on where the interplanetary internet has gotten. This was actually a, a project that was started in 1998 uh, with some of my colleagues at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. We began by thinking about the plans for the exploration of Mars. In 1997, we returned to Mars for the first time using a small spacecraft called a Pathfinder. It was a little robot that could move around on the surface. The previous successful mission was in 1976, the two Viking landers that landed, so it was 20 years later. So we met after the um, uh, Pathfinder mission had uh, arrived, and we said, what should we be doing so that 25 years from now we will be ready to support space exploration requirements 25 years hence. And what we concluded at that time is that we needed to create a networking environment that was as rich as the internet for space communication. Because up until that time, all of the spacecraft that had been out exploring the solar system were controlled by point-to-point -point radio links. And we wanted to have more complex kinds of configurations with multiple orbiters, multiple uh, spacecraft on the surface, some mobile, some sensor networks. Uh, manned and robotic missions working together. So we started out thinking that we could use the TCP IP protocols because they worked okay on Earth. And we thought, well, they should work on Mars. And that's actually probably correct. They would work on Mars, but they don't work very well between the planets. And there are several reasons for this. Uh, I think I have a list of them in the next slide, so I won't uh, I'll pick those up in a moment. I wanted you to know something about the pictures you're seeing here. Uh, in the upper uh, left part of the screen are uh, images of two of the orbiters that are still in orbit around Mars. Uh, they were originally sent there to map the surface of Mars to decide where the rover should land and go. Uh, the, on the upper right is the Phoenix spacecraft that landed in May of 2008 on the North Pole. On the lower left uh, is an image of the two rovers that landed in 2004. And in the lower right is the Mars Science Laboratory, Curiosity, which landed uh, in late 2005. I'm sorry, uh, 2012. That's right, this is 2013. So it landed in uh, August, I think, of 2012. What's interesting about all of these uh, spacecraft is that the original plan was for them to transmit data directly back to Earth to the deep space network. And when they turned on the um, uh, transmitters for the rovers in 2004, uh, they overheated. And so the immediate reaction was to back off on their use of those radios to avoid damaging them. And they were originally only scheduled to transmit at 28 kilobits a second. And that was pretty inadequate and the scientists were not too happy and when we told them we would have to back away on the duty cycle, they were even more unhappy. But somebody noticed that there was an X-band radio that could run at 128 kilobits a second, but it could only reach the orbiters. So the Jet Propulsion Laboratory engineers reprogrammed the rovers and the orbiters so the rover would send data up to an orbiter and the orbiter would hold onto it until it got to the correct spot in its orbit to transmit data back to Earth through the deep space network. And because the orbiters were outside of the atmosphere of Mars and had bigger solar panels, they could transmit data back to Earth at 128 kilobits a second. So all the data that's come back from Mars uh, 
since the rovers landed in 2004, have but come back through a store and forward path. It's a small three node network, Earth, Mars, and the orbiters. So that's what we uh, chose to do. It's just packet switching. Uh, we chose to develop a set of protocols that would um, do packet switching on an interplanetary basis. Now, the reason that TCP IP didn't work with, over these distances is that the speed of light is too slow. Uh, between Earth and Mars, when we're closest together in our orbits, it's 35 million miles. That's about three minutes uh, at the speed of light. And that means the round trip time is six minutes. And when they're farthest apart in our orbits, we're 20 minutes apart one way and 40 minutes round trip time. The TCP IP protocol flow control doesn't work with a 40 minute round trip time. So, uh, oh, there's another problem. It's called um, planetary rotation. And we haven't figured out how to stop that. So if you're on the surface of the planet and trying to communicate back to Earth and the planet rotates, eventually you can't talk to the other side because the planet is in the way. So that's disruption. So we ended up developing a set of protocols that we call the bundle protocol, which performed delay and disruption tolerance. So that set of protocols is now in use to support the interplanetary uh, backbone. And without going into a lot of detail on the uh, implementation, what's interesting about it is that it has, not only has it overcome the problems for deep space communication, but it's been tested terrestrially in tactical military communications, and I think would also be quite powerful for mobile communications in the cases where you can't maintain solid connectivity. So if the mobile becomes disconnected from a base station, it can still hold information until connection is, uh, is reestablished, and then the data can be forwarded. The only reason we can get away with that is memory is a lot less expensive now than it was 30 years ago. In the internet, we throw data away when there is no path to get to the destination. But in the DTN networks, we hold on to data until a connection comes up and then we transmit it further. So we actually get more use out of potentially disrupted links. Now this is what we hope will happen over the course of, uh, of many decades in the rest of the 21st century. As these protocols are standardized by the Consultative Committee on Space Data Systems, we hope all of the spacefaring uh, countries around the world will adopt them, which means that all of our spacecraft will be interoperable. When they have completed their primary scientific missions, they can be repurposed just as the orbiters were in the case of Mars to become nodes of an interplanetary backbone. And so we imagine over time as new missions are launched that we will literally grow an interplanetary backbone for both manned and robotic uh, communication over the course of the next several uh, decades. Now, interestingly enough, the story doesn't end there because there's another project. This one, again, sponsored by ARPA, DARPA. Uh, in this case, it's to design a spacecraft that, get, that can get to the nearest star in 100 elapsed years. So there are several problems uh, with this. If we try to go to Alpha Centauri, which is the nearest star system, it's 4.4 light years away. The current propulsion that's available to us would take 65,000 years to get to the nearest star. That's a little long even for an ARPA project. So the first problem is to de develop a uh, propulsion system that will get us up to 20% the speed of light. Now there's a little challenge here because um, uh, you imagine for a minute that if you get up to 20% the speed of light, you had better slow down before you get to Alpha Centauri. Otherwise, you'll go shooting through that solar system and you might get one image. That would be a very expensive photograph. So we need to slow down at, at the halfway point to go into orbit. That's one problem. The second problem is navigation. It's very common when we're navigating in interplanetary space that partway to the destination will make a mid-course correction. It's typically done by command from Earth to the spacecraft. But imagine that you're a light year away from Earth on your way to Alpha Centauri, and you want to send a mid-course correction. It will take a year for the radio signal to get to the spacecraft, and it will take another year to get back a signal telling us what happened. And so this is not a very responsive kind of system. Fortunately, 
we know enough about the proper motion of the stars in the near 10 light years from uh, our solar system that we can actually let the spacecraft make autonomous decisions about how to do mid-course corrections. So that problem is probably solvable. The last problem is how do you generate a signal from four light years away that we can detect? And so one thought has been to use femtosecond lasers, which are 10 to the minus 15 second lasers. If you can, can compress a 100 watt signal into 10 to the minus 15 seconds, you get a really big spike. And that should be detectable from a light year away, except for one problem. It, even though it's a collimated laser beam, you can imagine over a four light year distance, the beam spreads pretty dramatically. It's probably about the size of the solar system. So now we have to figure out how do we build a synthetic aperture receiver the size of the solar system in order to detect the signal. Now you know why I need the interplanetary backbone, and so I can build the receiver system to receive signals from the spacecraft going to Alpha Centauri. But one of the physicists in the system suggested another interesting solution. He said, you know, gravity bends light. That was how we demonstrated that Einstein's theory of gravity was correct. So if we could spend, send a spacecraft to 550 astronomical units away from the sun, we will be at the place where the sun's gravity focuses light into a point. At that point, we could take the signal coming from Alpha Centauri and focus it on that spacecraft that we have placed at the 550 AU distant location. So that's the current plan, is to consider how to get a spacecraft 550 AU away in order to detect the signals coming from Alpha Centauri. So that's the up-to-the-date story on the interplanetary and the interstellar system. I'll stop there. We have a few minutes for questions, and I very much appreciate your time this morning. So I'm not sure how we're going to do questions, but uh, do we have microphones? Yes, over there. Hi, Vint. We've got a first question. How should a government legislate uh, internet usage? Well, I'm sorry, how should what? How should uh, a government legislate internet usage from your point of view? Ah, okay. So, first of all, um, I think governments have an opportunity to create a legislative environment that will continue to allow internet to be a very open uh, kind of system. One of the interesting things about the net up until now has been that you don't have to get permission from anyone to bring up a new product or a service. Uh, you can invent new protocols and introduce them into the system. Larry and Sergey, uh, when they created Google, didn't have to get permission to do that. They just put the system up and, and uh, made it available. So this idea of permissionless innovation, I think, is an important thing to preserve. The second thing, thing that I believe is important is uh, sometimes called network neutrality. And I know that's sometimes a loaded term. But the point here is that if you don't have very much competition for the underlying broadband resources, then the parties who are controlling those broadband access to the net may be tempted to inhibit competition for applications that run on top of that pipe. So if you are offering video as a service, and there are others through that broadband pipe, and other people are competing with you, if you're in control of the pipe, it's very tempting to inhibit other people's service from running correctly. That's, that we consider to be a lack of network neutrality. I think that, it needs, that notion needs to be preserved. And the last thing, I think, is to um, adopt practices and procedures that will allow entrepreneurs to create new businesses. And in order for that to happen, you have to have the access to capital. You have to have access to a stream of, um, of well-educated engineers and business people in order to create business models that work. So the important part here is to make sure that government policy encourages the availability of capital and encourages universities to continue to turn out well-educated people. That's one of the reasons Silicon Valley works so well, because it has capital available, it has universities that turn out very well-educated uh, people. And there, I guess there's one other thing. In the Silicon Valley, the failure of a business does not mark you permanently. 
And in some parts of the world, maybe here in Europe, if you fail at a business, that's a mark that's on your forehead and it's very hard to get capital after that. I think that in, in our world, where I come from, if you fail once or twice, that's a mark of experience, but it's not a mark of incompetence necessarily. Sometimes the marketing conditions just don't work. So I would encourage a kind of um, tolerance for certain kinds of failure in order to take advantage of that as experience. So that's what I would do. Okay, we have time maybe for one more, if there is one. Then we finish early. All right, thank you very much.